The one-room school is an iconic image of the American settlement era. For many children in rural areas, this system of education carried on well into the 20th century. Well, I'm Brad Markson, and um, I went to school out at the Lund School District, uh, just about two miles from where I was born and raised. Yeah, the one room, one room country schoolhouse. I'm Nancy Shores. I uh, started to Sunny Slope, a one room school, in the fall of 1957. I'm Phil Worm. I was one year behind Nancy. I took two years of country school at Sunny Slope. And your brother and sister? Yes, we are brother and sister. Yes. My name's John Barrett. I uh, grew up uh, about four and a half miles southwest of Oberlin on the Sapper Creek and uh, went to this school. And I'm Randy Wilson and I uh, went to Star School for three years starting in 1966 to 1969. Yeah, I'm Dave Wilson and I Went there at Star School for six years. I'm Mike Wilson. I went to school at Star School from first grade till sixth grade. We grew up right across the road from the school, so we walked to school every day. The school closed in 1960, and we came to Oberlin to school. Yeah, I'd have rather had all eight grades in country school. I had three kids in my class, me and a cousin, and usually a preacher's kid or someone that had moved in for a few short years. We generally had all, maybe all eight grades, not, not always, but you know, we were, the older kids, as we would get our work done, we would help, we'd sit and listen to the first graders read. All six years, I had the same school teacher. Um, she came there uh, when I was uh, in first grade and I had her all the way through sixth grade and then the uh, school districts consolidated and all went into town and our, our school district, uh, they sold the schoolhouse. This program is talking about one room schools and they were all over Kansas and all over the Great Plains and other places. This particular school is called the St. Paul School. It has been moved and restored by Dr. Richard Mosier, who we'll talk to today, when the geographic townships were laid out. In every township, section 16 and section 36 were called school sections. And a lot of people get confused about that because they thought, well, there was never a school on those. That was just the name. These were reserved so that the state of Kansas could sell them. They couldn't be homesteaded. They had to be sold at public auction, and that money went to the schools to support those. Not only the universities, but also the, the school districts uh, throughout the state. And Sheridan County, which we're in now, at one time had as many as 80 uh, school districts of one-room schools and two-room schools scattered throughout. We're lucky today to have Dr. Richard Mosher. He is an educator internationally known. He was a developer of Colby Community College back in the late 1960s. And from there, went to Claremore, Oklahoma, to a school down there and developed it, which is now Rogers State University, isn't That's it? That's correct, yes. Where the St. Paul School is now is on his family's property. And so this is a restoration. After the school closed in the, well, late 1950s, it was moved to a farmstead and used as a garage for a while. And from that farmstead, it was moved to here. And a lot of work went into it to restore it to its original condition with some of the original desks. He and uh, 10 of his siblings went to this school. But the schoolhouse was a, a, an important spot for all of us in our family and was in, in the families of every, everybody in terms of uh, Western Kansas. It was a place where, of course, the ch children went and then the parents came and there was parties and box suppers and one kind of uh, lecturing going on on occasion. We had two important buildings in our youth. We, one was a ranch house 
and the second was a schoolhouse, and the rest of it we didn't know anything about. <laughs> but it was good. It wasn't any large enrollment. I don't think the enrollment ever exceeded over 20 students, and it was uh, enrollment from uh, first grade through eighth. The uh, one-room school was a, a really a fine innovation for its time. Uh, one of the advantages of the one-room school, if a person had difficulty in learning, uh, wasn't particularly up to par, he or she could sit back here in the back row. They were in the seventh or the eighth grade, and they could hear the recitations of the first grade, second grade, third grade, fourth grade, fifth grade, all the way up, so that whatever they missed when they were in that grade, they picked it up and going around and going again. I, I remember some students who were big guys, and, and, but they were uh, very attentive. When the, when the school started in 1895, that was my, it was the first teacher here was my great aunt. She was quite a lady, uh, her given name was Elizabeth Moser, but her, uh, everyone knew her as Lizzie. Yeah. We were favored because uh, we had um, good teachers. It was amazing, but uh, my first grade teacher was uh, Hazel Steinshaw, and she lived in Hoxie. And so she drove out from Hoxie every day to, um, to the St. Paul School. And uh, I valued her tremendously. She, she had a, a, one thing that's unique about this school was that it had a uh, pump organ. Now, I believe the pump organ must have belonged to Hazel Steinshaw because when she left at the end of the third year that I was in school, I think the pump organ disappeared too. Oh. But okay. she could play that thing and play almost anything each day. We began with a song fest, and we each had our own songbook, and we were allowed to pick the songs that we were going to sing. Each of us had a favorite song, you know, and so we were quick to get that, that favorite song out there. And she could play it, and we, we would sing our little hearts out, and then, by golly, we were ready for the day, you know. It was kind of tough on the teachers, and I knew the teachers, boy, in a, even in the early 1900s, the men were making like $27 a month, and the female teachers, $23 a month. That's right. It's interesting going through the history books and looking, you can look at census books that they have and see that uh, a certain person lived with another family and they were the teacher for, for that year, a few years at that schoolhouse. They always talked about room and board. So they had a room and they had the food. And that was part of every family that had students in school to pay their share. Because the county was paying the salary, but the teachers were roaming around and they didn't have their own place. And due to transportation, they couldn't live 15 miles away in the early days and make it to school. This feature of rooming with families changed for teachers over the decades as automobiles became more prevalent and commuting from town was more feasible. Oh, I, I remember uh, Miss Esther Lindquist rode her Honda yeah. to school. Honda 50. Yeah, <laughs> a Honda, Honda 50, wasn't it? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, and they had an article in the paper and they named it uh, Teacher a go go rides Honda to school. And that upset <laughs> Miss Esther. She was not happy. She was not happy about that at all. Uh, Mrs. Woolley was a teacher. And I don't know how old she was, but I, I think she was up there in the years. Uh, but she was a great teacher and all that. Baseball was a big hit at noon recess. And our teacher, Sarah, we did not call her Miss Sarah, we called her Sarah, was 69 my first grade year, and she would go out, and I remember her putting her arms around me as I held a bat, and she would help us bat, and uh, I'm thinking she probably ran a base or two for us. I have, I have fond memories of my first grade teacher, uh, and she was here for about three years, and then she left, and then there was another teacher, and I remember her, and I remember the teacher that followed her, and, and finally I ended up with uh, 
a lady made, named Mrs. Zyda Schropp, and uh, she was about uh, here for about three or four years until I graduated here from the eighth grade. Fern Moore served as a one-room country school teacher in the 1950s. The first one was my third year of teaching at Beaver Valley, which was a one-room school uh, uh, two or three miles west of Cedar Bluff, Kansas. I started out with six pupils and uh, the following semester after Christmas, two more. That first school was not more than eight and the other one room of school was 13. So since I started my first year of teaching in Oberlin with 34 sixth graders, there was quite a contrast. <laughs> It was much easier to teach a one-room school. When you have six or eight kids, or even 13, you feel you can reach their needs more readily. All right, it, it was difficult because you had so many classes, but the big help there was that I, in both places, I had eighth graders, seventh and eighth graders, and often they could help the younger ones. There was the second grader, who learned multiplication tables and they weren't taught till third grade simply by listening. And I didn't even know it till we took the printed tests at the end of the year that she had absorbed so much. Yeah. So yes, there's that advantage. And then I think the, the older students, the seventh and eighth graders, gained a lot from helping. Uh, the other big thing that I found were the the community, and the parents were incredibly supportive. Uh, do you want to hear a story about a couple of uh, a twin eighth graders? Absolutely, yeah. They were always wrestling and tussling with each other. They both became champion wrestlers in high school, so maybe they were just getting practice. <laughs> but it was a kind of a di distraction. So one Friday evening, I stopped and visited with their mother. And this was toward the end of the school year. And when I came back the next week, those kids, boy, two boys were perfect. <laughs> I went through uh, eight years of a uh, one-room school, so I could kind of draw on my own experiences as a pupil in a one-room school, a small one. My dad went through the uh, same country school that I did in the early 1900s, you know, and they had large classes. I sometimes don't know how when they had 30 to 40, and, and you read the history, you know that sometimes one teacher would have as much as 60 or 70 kids in a school. I don't know how they ever lived through that. <laughs> It was a fairly good sized room. Uh, you know, I'd say the building was 20 foot, maybe 20 by 40 or so. And we had a little entry porch when we came in that had, you'd hang your coat up on a rack up in there and, and put your lunch boxes in there. And then you'd have, you'd bring your lunch in and eat inside when it was lunchtime and that. Well, we had electricity, but we didn't have any indoor plumbing. We didn't have any water. We had outhouses, had two of them. I'm not sure we had to ask permission to go to the outhouse. We had outhouses because there was no running water. Yeah, we had electricity, we had running water. We also did have a privy outside, and in case the uh, pump wasn't working and that, uh, the girls would go out and get to go use the outhouse, and then later on, the boys would get to go out and get to use it. Did, did we have a bathroom when you started, yes. Dave? I guess I am the only... Uh, school board member of a one-room schoolhouse that's still alive in this county. When we first moved down there, I, uh, they, they didn't have any indoor restrooms. And uh, I remember being out working across the road and seeing people when the weather was bad having to walk out to the outhouse. And uh, one thing I thought about when I went on the, First thing I'd like to do is uh, put some water over there and make some restrooms. Uh, water, we went, we had a water well right outside and uh, there was a water, uh, like a crock water jug. Somebody 
would would bring in a, oh it must have been a five gallon galvanized jug of water probably at the beginning of each week we'd take turns but we would be go out and get uh, water out of the well it was an electric well bring in a bucket of water and pour it in the in the drinking water uh, there'd be another couple would put the flag up we had a flag that we put up every morning we had a flag pole of course you know mm -hmm. and uh, sometimes that that was done by the older students was raising of the flag we always started each day with the flag salute yes I got to raise the flag some. It was passed around among us to raise the flag. And I'm sure with raising the flag, Phil, we had to learn to probably fold the flag. Yes. Yes, we did. We had uh, people designated to go out and raise the flag in the morning. And then we did a Pledge of Allegiance and uh, and then we'd start classes. So we had the bench up front, you know, where we could, uh, they would come up to the one grade at a time, would come up and we'd do our little class and then they'd go back to either do the work on their own or have an older one help them. We would uh, start with the, if I remember right, the younger grades and work our way up through the Everybody had a class and go up to the table, they had a long table, but we didn't have it filled very much uh, with classes. Our, my class of four was a, was a big class, and we looked forward to recess. We always played games at recess, played 16 skidoo and uh, Four Softball, corners. four, four corners. corners. Yeah. yeah, four corners around the building. Red Rover, Red Rover. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Kick the can. Uh, hide and seek. If you can imagine we're top of a hill in the middle of a prairie, we actually played hide and seek. You know, there was places to hide. <laughs> we had a pretty decent set of swing, real heavy duty swings, oh, wow. and. Uh, and uh, the slipper slide, I think, if I remember right, you know, and the uh, teeter-totter. Remember swinging up as high as you could go and then bailing out. That yeah, was a big deal. Yeah. And then, you know, you got all different ages, so it's, uh, it's fun to go out and play with all of them. And I'm sure the bigger kids enjoy the recess just as much as the little kids. We played games like, uh, oh, handy over, handy over, and that was over the top of the, uh, School house. Teacher loved that. Yeah, yeah, all right. <laughs> and we had uh, another game we called Prisoner's Base. And then we, uh, when the boys were in kind of uh, majority, we'd, we would have battles, you know, and we would, one, one side would go down in the greater ditch in front of the house, um, of schoolhouse, and the other would be up near the swing set. Well, the swing set people, and they were, usually charged with uh, invading the, the greater ditch. Yeah. And we didn't, of course, we had to make our own sound effects so we could say, bang, I got you, Henry. And well, then Henry didn't, maybe he didn't think he got got. Yeah. <laughs> Just wounded, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, right. Yeah. But to, to know how to die was a big deal. Yeah. I mean, yeah. Yeah, the dying you, scenes yeah. were good. Yeah, yeah. yeah. If, you, if you could die well, well, you yeah. were a favorite <laughs> uh, target. You know, lunch was always a big deal. Everybody bring, of course, their, their lunch, and we'd stop and eat lunch, and then, of course, as soon as lunch was over, you get to go out for recess, so you'd get through that as fast as you, as you could. We always brought our lunches to school, and sometimes in the wintertime, our mothers would fix, uh, like, pot pies and would cook them in the morning. We'd bring them to school, and then about 11.30, we'd set them on the heating stove and warm them up so we'd have a hot lunch. We lived across the road, so part of the time we'd walk home, eat a hot lunch at home, then come back, but we had to hurry back so we'd get in for recess. After lunch, usually, the teacher would read you a couple of chapters of a book, mm -hmm. and we'd sit and listen to the teacher. We'd color, you'd get a color page or something, and you'd color while she was reading, yeah. My friend Flicka. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> One of my memories is at Christmas, 
They would string a wire across the room and these old green plastic curtains would be the stage. There's places that we used to have wires across that would run across the front and there'd be curtains. Usually there were three or four schools that are, were cooperating in getting the curtains. You know, you had to have, if you had a stage, you had to have curtains. Christmas time was a favorite time in this school and it was in all of them as far as I know. We would have a Christmas play or Christmas night where we'd put on a program. Each student would have an individual uh, part. They would have a, some kind of a poem or either they would be talking about some kind of a story or uh, presenting some kind of thing to the uh, assembled parents. There was a feeling of camaraderie, of course, the classes were small. I mean, uh, as I said earlier, you know, perhaps n never much larger than 20, and usually representing maybe five to six families. Uh, and so there were brothers and sisters and, and all of that. A lot of, uh, lot of camaraderie was born and a lot of relationship was born in, in those years. I still love the kids I went to school with out there. Uh, I think we can, most of us can pick up, pick up a conversation and carry on, even though some of us are spread far and wide. You know, you, the close bonding of the friends, uh, neighbors that you had around there was, uh, was, was special. It was kind of like a family though. Our whole community was kind of like a family, to be honest with you. I mean, everybody, you know, we, we went to the country church also with the same, very same people and went to 4-H with a lot of those kids. And, and you talk to other kids that, like at class reunions that have gone to country school and, and I think they feel the same way, those memories that, about uh, the other kids they went to school with and their teachers. I never missed going to, to the city school. You know, I didn't know anything different. I don't know, it seemed like it was just a closer knit type thing. I always thought, and as you kind of mentioned before, that the education was quite good because the older students were getting a review and the younger ones were being around and knew what to expect the next year. Yes, yes I think they got a good education. It all depended on the teachers, you know. If you had good teachers, they got the job done. And they were able to go on to college and do well. Uh, you and all of your 10 siblings had a college education. Yes. From a one-room school. Mm -hmm, that's right. Very amazing. Had you looked at eighth grade, uh, seventh and eighth grade class books for back in the early 1900s? Oh my gosh. They taught things we didn't teach learn in high school. The eighth grade ceremonies were held in town for all the country school kids. Uh, and that was big stuff for us. You know, we went to the high school auditorium and uh, it would have flowers arranged all the way across the front and everyone, uh, all of the parents were there and we were expected to march across the street with some decorum. A, you know, I don't know, but I value the fact that I graduated from a one-room school. I, yeah. I, uh, I brag about that, you know. You should. <laughs> Thank you.